it has been proven in studies, and it's kind of common sense, that the net gain here of violence that would have happened or th crime that would have happened or community downtroddenness that would have happened and would have spread if these sales had happened on the street and not online is kind of inarguable. But it's a slippery slope again because then the government has to admit like, oh, someone went around all the laws and technically they're more right. And it's, it's impossible to quantify. Now the third one. The third one is one I've really, especially over the past three months or so, been looking at extremely closely, and it's it's a wide open one. Are you familiar with Ross Ulbrich and the Silk Road? Oh, very familiar. <laughs> the life sentence, man. He got okay. a life sentence. Can you take people through what that whole situation was? All right, so Ross Ulbricht uh, was the founder of the Silk Road. Silk Road was a uh, online marketplace accessible only through... It's what's called a tour browser, which mm -hmm. was uh, it's like an it anim major internet traffic anonymous, so you couldn't be tracked. And then you access this uh, online marketplace where you could buy all kinds of stuff. You could buy uh, drugs, you could buy guns, g guns. You could buy like order hits on there. Although I don't know, like most yeah, of, we'll, most we'll, of those we'll were talk, government we'll, setups. We'll talk about that, yeah. Um, and it was paid for in Bitcoin, which again is a, a an anonymous currency. Basically, you can't trace a Bitcoin. Kind of can. And this was early days of Bitcoin, too. This was yeah. 2011 through 2013 when it was active. Uh, I won't name any names, but one of my college roommates was on the Silk, Ro <laughs> Silk Road doing some things, um, <laughs> which is how I knew about Bitcoin. And, and he was in Bitcoin early. So, but anyway. He's uh, doing all right. I'm not going to say it. No, he, I think he sold all his Bitcoin, Ooh. but I'm not, I'm not naming names here. Okay. But either way, um, yeah, so um, I forget when he when he got arrested but um he got arrested and um for operating the silk road it was like a big sting operation Ulbrich did Ulbrich did ross Ulbrich did um he was so he was he actually went to penn state i believe right he did he went to do his masters at penn state yeah, yeah he's from texas but yep. he, he went to penn state um the government they arrested him in like sweden so they arrested him overseas somewhere, right? Or did they arrest him in the U.S.? No, they arrested him in San Fran yeah. in a library. Yeah. And the um, way they arrested him was they needed, because of all this like debauchery yeah. with oh, yeah. how to have shit encrypted and operating on tour, they needed to have the laptop Catch him open. in the act. Yep. Yeah. Like so they on, were able to get it. Yeah. I I think there was definitely a documentary. I watched a documentary on that. I watched like probably a couple. How they caught Deep him. Is, yeah, yeah. They caught him is interesting because they just did a Google search of of his name like or the silk road something i forget what they did they they f somehow found his name and they they searched something and they found like the first time it appeared on the internet and then they got his name from that and it was just like a really like wow this is how the F the fbi used google to find this guy well yes it's a thousand percent correct there were interesting parts on this case though first of all these agencies usually always all fight like they don't deal with each other it's it's all this intergovernmental rivalry and all that and there was that still existed here definitely especially with homeland but the people who brought this guy down who were really working closely together at the end were literally an f a a specific team at the fbi headed by chris tarbell who was i think his first name was chris who was a cyber expert and done a lot of big cases like the anonymous guys he had done that one okay and then there was the dea was involved but the dea was a pain it wasn't homeland it was the dea who was a pain in people's balls so they basically kept those out but there was a guy jared deryangian or something like that at homeland security who the fbi team loved so they worked closely with him and then there was a guy at the irs this guy gary alford who's the one who found that uh, the, the Google thing you were talking about, who was basically brought on the team to track the money and try to see if they could tie it yeah. to things and do the really learn the Bitcoin scenario of it and how that works. And then they all worked together and got him that way. But the controversy outside of that, what you were talking about was he had posted under a pseudonym Altoid on some online chat during the early days of the silk road somewhere else saying oh have you heard of the silk road and gary alford went and did specific google searches like it took him a while but once he got there he realized that there was another thing traceable to that name that yes. had posted ross albrick at gmail.com yep. or something like and that and then that's how they got that's how they got him they had really no they, 
they had no leads until that point, but like then once they got him, they're like, oh, this this all makes sense. So he when he was operating the Silk Road, I remember there was certain points where um, there was like a sting operation. I forget how it transpired, but basically Ross Aldrich ended up um, ordering a hit on someone. And um, this hit was, he believed the hit was actually carried out, Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually just agents faking the whole thing the whole time. And so Ross, like, from his perspective, he was communicating with this hitman. The hitman said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to kill this person. Take pictures when you're finished. Send pictures to Ross. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, the job's done, whatever. From Ross's perspective, he was like, all right, he killed this person. I forget... You know, that's I forget, exactly. I forget the exactly details right. of that hit yeah. and like why it, it transpired or why it happened. But basically, yeah, he ordered he ordered a hit. Now I need to say this because I've recorded a ton of podcasts this week. So usually when I do a podcast, it's released inside of ten days. A lot of them are inside of five or six. But this one may be released after we know which way this is going to go, whether he gets commuted or not. Either way, this is an important thing to talk about. So if you're listening and you already know if he was commuted. Here's some logic behind why and why it makes sense uh, or doesn't based on whatever you're going to say. And if he wasn't commuted, well, the same thing goes. But yes to that scenario as far as like the hit that that did all go down. And they again, because they caught him in the act and they were able to get the laptop and then get all the information off of it because he didn't get to hit the kill switch on it. They they can go see The chats, the literal instant messages that occurred via what was known as the Dread Pirate Roberts account. That was his pseudonym, yeah. Yes. Now, two things here. Number one, the way the FBI went and got access to the server, what happened was when the guy Gary Alford, the IRS agent, found that thing, that Altoid thing online, there was something else that had to do with another email that was registered to one of those chat rooms where it was like frosty at frosty.com. I, I forget. Something like that. That is how they corroborated that it was Ross because they had discovered, and I put that in air quotes, the FBI had discovered, I, w- I really want to bring my guy Jim in here to talk about this ex-FBI guy because I want to push him on this. They discovered the server for the Silk Road in Iceland. Yes, they got lucky. They got lucky. They were able to like sniff a stray packet. Yeah. And but I know I know my shit. Te- you know your shit. You know your shit yeah. inside and out. The second level to it was once they did that though, it was encrypted to get in there. When they got in there, they found that the server was registered under Frosty. That's how they made the connection. Oh, Frosty at Frosty.com, Altoid, Ross at Ulbrich.gmail. Servers called Frosty, boom, we got them. And that's how they knew to then have the warrant to be able to go in. But they got into an encrypted server. And to make a more complicated situation very simplified, the FBI's explanation is that basically there was a breakdown in the CAPTCHA system. Now, when I say CAPTCHA, all of you listening, you have encountered this online. You will go to some site and a a thing, a prompt will show up and it'll say, I'm not a robot. And it'll say, identify the crosswalk in each of these pictures. Like, how's a robot telling me to say, I'm not a robot. You're the robot. Yeah, well, true, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Point is, it's a very simple thing. You click the fucking crosswalks and then you move on. They were basically claiming that there was some kind of hole in the server that allowed them to suddenly have a loophole where it just prompted them for a captcha and poof, they were in. What most likely happened when you talk to actual forensic computer experts, and I have to hedge and say most likely, hypothetically, that could have happened, but most computer forensics experts are offended by this explanation and say this makes absolutely no sense. The only way they could have done what they did is if they illegally hacked into it, which is a whole, it's basically like in violate infringing on your rights as an American citizen for them to do that. So that, that's one end of it. But couldn't then they, if they got a warrant, couldn't they hack it? And that's what I was wondering, but no, apparently the way the law works. And again, like check me on this people, but based on what I've read up on this, the law is that you cannot allow the government to hack into things. Cause then same thing, where do you draw the line? It's the same thing as just walking Uh, into your house without a warrant. You're right. So it's like, yeah, I understand why. You you know what? I probably should be 
uh, up to date on this like case law, but I guess it's why you basically would have a court order saying to Apple, "Can you unlock this?" You know, like actually, that's a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not like we're going to do this from our our system. Like, you remember the San Bernardino shooter, like yeah, four years yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually. As sad as this is, hats off to Tim Cook at Apple there because Tim Cook said, look, I would like nothing more than to unlock this guy's phone and make sure there are no other killers out there or whatever or see who he was talking to because the government was going to him saying, Tim, unlock the phone. And and he said, I, I can't do that, though, because if I do it here, I'm I'm breaking our data privacy laws that we promised to our customers. And where do we draw the line? And it, he just he made a call there, and, and I think he made the right call. Some people said it was like no, a big like press release, like article about it. Yeah, big. Like that was yeah. he had a lot of lights on him, and I thought he knocked that one out of the park handily. And it sucks because you would have liked to have all that information. And I, don't, I you know, don't worry, I, I don't know how true that is though, because I dealt with a case when I was in um, when I was clerking for the judge where we it was a sub, so a suppression issue. Um, Basically, if you believe evidence was obtained in violation of the Constitution, you file a motion to suppress, which would basically say this evidence can't come in sure, as evidence. Sure. It was obtained in violation of the Constitution. I'll explain this case. So, okay. um, This is why I got you here. I love yeah. this. Yeah. So there was a case where it was a search of a cell phone. So the police have this guy in custody, and they say, can we search your cell phone? And he was like, sure, you can search my cell phone. Um, and, and they made him fill out a cell phone consent search form. And he was like, all right, sub item to be searched, you know, black iPhone. Um, what is the password to your phone? And he put down the password Ooh. to his phone, whatever. And the police were like, thanks, we're going to search that. And then the police went and did a complete digital forensic download of his, of his phone and recovered deleted messages, recovered all this other stuff, like... Um, deleted photos, deleted messages, and found incriminating evidence in the dele deleted digital forensic download of the phone. The defense attorney argued that that was beyond the scope of the consent, right? Because the consent was, this guy just, you're just searching my cell phone. You're not, I thought you were just going to, I gave you my passcode. I thought you were just going to go in and look through my phone. Oh. Instead, you went and did this digital download and searched all this other stuff. I, I remember what we ruled. We ruled, I, I wrote the opinion, we ruled it was. It expanded the, the consent of the search there. So we said the, the consent of the search was um, that you, you know, it was just limited to a, a regular customary look through the phone by, by way of the fact that he gave the password to the phone. The person reasonably thought that his consent meant that they were just going to look through it. But was part of that, let me ask this, was part of that ruling based on coercion by police not in the presence of a lawyer and a reasonable intelligence of someone who is not an attorney representing themselves in that scenario well so that's like a that's at play basically in any of those scenarios but that wasn't the key issue there we basically said the consent was good like there was nothing wrong with the consent so that is an issue in any time you have you know anytime the police take statements or, yeah. or things like that without an attorney um and I think he may have. I think it was probably read his Miranda rights again. I don't. That that wasn't the issue. But um, basically, we said yeah, he, the consent was good, but the police just ex expanded what a reasonable per sure. person would have thought they were allowing the police to search in that scenario. But the reason I'm and I'm trying to bring this back, and we're probably losing a lot of people right no, now. No, talking. no, no. This is, this is compelling. I know what you're doing. Go but ahead. the reason I think that I, I think the police can search. I think if you get a warrant the police have these forensic download machines that they can just get this download. So if in that case, the police either had to get clear unequivocal consent to get all this up extraneous information or just get a warrant. They didn't get one. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't get a warrant. They went with the consent aspect in that. Yeah. yeah. They, and well, the, again though, this is when they're hunting him. So they hadn't approached him yet or they didn't approach him until they arrested him. But they never got the warrant. And then the whole problem was it was so – I don't even want to say politicized. It, it wasn't. It, there were a lot of people who had a visceral reaction to what the Silk Road was, and so it was controversial that way. So it was court of public opinion, which is a whole other thing here. Like how hard is it to get a trial, especially with all the attention in the internet these days? And this was, you know, certainly one where social media was a big thing happening sure. in 2014, 2015 when this trial was gearing up to go. 
But the question is, if they didn't have the warrant and hacked in, then was was it all a sham? Yeah. Now let's let's even go off that. Let's pretend that doesn't exist. Let's say the case gets made and and they reasonably determine it was him. You brought up the whole point of the hit, and here's here's yeah, the problem. I think Ross got a raw deal, but yeah, you continue. Here's the problem. They need a boogeyman. You're in government. You got to make a case, right? Sure. And guess what? They did get the guy who created the Silk Road. We know yeah. Ross did that. He, I believe, his attorney admitted that in court. That, yeah, he did. He did create the website, the Silk Road. That's corroborated by people like the one person in his life, his girlfriend, who knew about it from day one. It's corroborated by everyone. So we we know that he did that. But Ross was, to give a little background here, he was an ultra-libertarian, and he's what I call an unrealistic libertarian. This is why it's important to say commutation and not pardon. There's no doubt Raw Ross broke the law here and had to go to jail. There's no question about that. This is not a pardon situation. Yeah. The question is what you pointed out, which is that his sentence that was handed down at the end of this, which was double life plus 40 years, no parole – is quite excessive for somebody who just created a website. Now, the context of the hits is that the government, when they arrested him, had claims based on undercover operatives they had. You pointed out that was exactly what happened on one of them in particularly where they literally had a DEA agent on the other end of the chat who was posed undercover as a Colombian drug dealer or something who was saying, oh. Do, do, do you remember why he was ordering people killed though? Yes. Yes. So this one guy, Curtis Green, was a, was somebody who – was one of the personalities on the Silk Road underneath a name, a pseudonym online, who was in the know about a lot of stuff, and the government caught him. And so he was like kind of a weak, feebly guy, and he started telling the government things, I believe. And, and he knew who Ross was? Ross knew who he was because what Ross required, and I say Ross here Oh, lightly, yeah, he required the IDs and stuff of everyone, yeah. So he knew who everyone was. No one else knew IDs. And he didn't know – there's still like – there's some people that like he didn't know who they were. But when it came to this guy, he knew who it was. So he knew this Curtis Green guy was a problem. And I say Ross here, and this is why I put it in big quotations because – Ross started the whole Silk Road, and for the first year or so, he was listed as admin. And then his username changed from admin to Dread Pirate Roberts, which was a play on the whole Princess Bride character or whatever. It was like a funny whatever. The government arrested him and claimed that between that hit I just pointed on and then five others that were similar or whatever, where he said on a chat, yes, let's waste this guy or whatever. Meaning we're going to pay you – he would say, here's the amount of Bitcoin. We'll pay for it or here's the cost. He would admit to wanting to pay people to do it and then they they would do it. Now, the Curtis Green guy, it didn't happen because he didn't know it was the government on the other end. So they sent him a picture that was tomato soup and it looks yeah. – I don't know if you ever seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it, yeah. Oh, dude, it looks – yeah. There's no way I wouldn't look at that and say that's not real yeah. where they showed this guy make it look like he was drowned to death. Yeah. and. So anyway, it didn't happen, but he still – they had the evidence of him ordering the hit. The problem is when the government arrested him and came out with, oh, this is – these are the charges against him, there was this long period of silence in the year or so, little over a year building up to his trial where then right when the trial went to start, they miraculously dropped all the charges. They did not bring the charges of the hits. He was not found guilty of any hits. He was not even charged with them. And so the question here is the government's also on yeah. record with their own logs behind the scenes saying, like these guys in the FBI or Homeland Security saying they believe the Dread Pirate Roberts to be a few different people. There was also an interview done with Andy Greenberg, who's one of the best tech reporters in the country, where he interviewed Dread Pirate Roberts via chat while it was active for like four hours. And that – and this could be a total lie. Right, could have been Ross on the other end. That Dread Pirate Roberts was saying, "No, I didn't create the site. Someone else did, but he didn't want it anymore, and he went to hand it off." Ross Holbrook was not a coder. 
He knew how to do it. He was not a computer programmer by trade, though. This was a very complicated thing to do. And so when you look, not to go in all the details, but when you look at the history of his story and what he was doing over those years, it makes a lot of sense that maybe he would have continued involvement, but he wasn't running it. And so the government didn't even allow discovery on anything substantive until the trial itself. So the defense was coming in there basically blind. It was a closed courtroom. They put him in front of a judge who was notoriously hard on drug offenders. Notoriously hard. It was a female judge, I believe, right? Yeah, Catherine Forrest, I what, think. Um, where was this tried again? The Southern District of New York. Okay. So, you know, basically in, in, the, in the biggest casino of them all, trying it minus the Supreme Court. And they they had dropped all these charges, and then he was found guilty of everything. And it's like, all right, you know, he's going to get 10, 15 years in prison, maybe 5, 10, something like that. Everyone else who was found guilty of shit got like five years. Everyone else, regardless of what they did. And the government tried to say he was the only one because the government had no evidence on who the other two could be. They They had – thoughts on there were a couple guys that are like it could definitely be these two guys but they didn't have any hard evidence like they had for ross that he was definitely a guy behind sure. it which he was and so they did not allow for him to be able to say hey yes i started this website yes i still had something to do with it but no i wasn't that guy doing that thing he got caught behind the fact that he had to be a pseudonym online and so other people most likely also because he wasn't a computer programmer most likely fucked him and so now he's got this long ass sentence and he took things too far, but here's the last point of it, and this is what I really want you to respond to. <laughs> if you don't know, if you're unfamiliar with the saga, you're going to be very confused with the last five minutes. But it's it, if you haven't looked into this case, go do it. It is fucking insane. Super but the last point is that I mentioned he was a radical libertarian. And so to generalize here. The radical libertarian belief is that everything is based on individual choice and freedom. The most radical libertarians say no government, right, which is not realistic. But he wanted to say that the war on drugs in this scenario was an enormous mistake and that people, while they shouldn't do drugs, have a right to decide what they want to do. And because of the war on drugs, we created violent communities where – Drugs then cause a lot of other exterior crimes and pull sure. down entire areas. So what he wanted to do was use the internet to allow a safe place for people who are going to do this to go do it. And he even had educational stuff on there like, hey, you, if you do this drug, here's how to get help or whatever, which isn't yeah. to say like that solves the problem. But sure. point being, he was looking at a utopitarian world and he took it way too far. But morally – Let's even say he did the hits, and, and it. my opinion is he didn't. But let's say he did. Even with those six hits, even with some of the step. people who died as a result of taking drugs that they got on this site. Sure. It has been proven in studies, and it's kind of common sense, that the net gain here of violence that would have happened or th crime that would have happened or community downtroddenness that would have happened and would have spread if these sales had happened on the street and not online is kind of inarguable but it's a slippery slope again because then the government has to admit like oh someone went around all the laws and technically they're more right and it's it's impossible to quantify because yes. so you're you're looking at it from the perspective of okay all these drug transactions happened in this safe space but they would have happened like you know in at at a trap house in the hood otherwise and like someone could have gotten shot or something but how many people wouldn't have gone to that trap house in the hood and instead just logged on to their tour browser and bought drugs that they otherwise wouldn't have bought so that's another you know you, it's it's impossible to quantify but but i do think so i actually forgot i thought that ross i, I thought that he was convicted with um with respect to the uh to the hits nope. So it was just all drug crimes and you got a life life sentence. Yeah, I think most people that like offend something about you. You're like, look, like, like he's serving life in prison and he he's he didn't take anyone's life or he's not being charged with that. The government needed the boogeyman, like I said, but at least in the past, is on whether we find out about it years later or based on folklore, whatever it is, the way a lot of these situations go and. He would have done this kicking and screaming because he was no fan of the government. No doubt about that. But you get a guy like that, you say, all right, you know, 
you know, spend a couple years in jail, but here's the deal, deal, pal. You work for us now. And when you come out of jail, you work for us for 10 years. Because the shit he knows and has access to, you're the government, you're like, oh shit, that's some talent. Like, we, we want that working here. All right, let's use it for good. Or what but you said he wasn't a good. coder, so what's his skills besides he just was the first to think well, of it? Well, I, I, and that was generalized. He did know how, he did learn how to do that stuff. My point is, by trade, he wasn't an expert hacker. He wasn't like that. So, yes, you're right. It's a little bit different. But he had access to the entire dark web and had been someone who was on record being a part of it for a long time. And there's got to be things that you can use that with. Sure. I would agree with that, probably. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It just, I think it offend it offends, you know, what I think most people think of the criminal justice system that you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you're, all he's being convicted of is basically, it's just like, what, just like narcotic trafficking, like drug trafficking. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of crazy that he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail. And uh, I remember he appealed it. He was denied the circuit level. Mm -hmm. And then he sought um he petitioned for certiorari with the supreme court and was denied they didn't the supreme meaning the supreme court didn't chose not to hear his case so i guess yeah his only option now is um is a commutation, commutation or yeah. a pardon yeah and it's 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 a flaming ball of fire to catch if you're any court because some of the there are a lot of people that support him heavily but some of the optics around it suck because look drugs are big problem and people it's an emotional thing people lose family members over it the addiction is one of the saddest things to ever be around oh, yeah. and you know and so but he didn't he didn't make the drugs and didn't yeah. you know force anyone to take them well he technically did make some mushrooms at the beginning but that's not like heroin and stuff <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean like he's not true he was doing the least i i as know. i understood it for the most part it was just connecting buyers yes. and sellers and anonymously and yeah, and that's wild. That's the thing. He created, he really was. I mean, what he created, regardless of when he gave up control, if that's indeed what happened, or ceded some of his control, the system he created, as crazy as this is to say, is essentially on a level of the disruption of things like Amazon. <laughs> and, and, oh, yeah. You know, he. He well, had millions of people on there. And it's not like it went away. No. The next Silk Road popped up almost instantly. <laughs> yeah, just under a different name. And it's going to keep doing that because people are like, you can, when you can make your internet traffic anonymous and you can make your payment anonymous, you can just have a, a like underground marketplace. And by the way, I believe, we'll check this after, I believe the NSA is who invented Tor for what that's worth. I, like it's I their think so tool too. Yeah. that they invented. Yeah, I, and I mean, it makes sense, and there's, you know, I, I fully support, like, making your internet traffic anonymous if you want to. Like, why not? Yeah, and let's it, not... It, it helps freedom of speech in, like, other, like, for instance, other countries say you live in a country with, like, an oppressive authoritarian government, and, like, you want to say something, you want to do, like, you know, like, you can you do can stuff do like that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of great purposes of that. Two things that are other after effects of this. Number one... He's more relevant now because of COVID. He's more relevant because people, there is an enormous movement. I wouldn't even call it a political movement. I don't know if you call it an awakening. I don't know what you call it. But there are a lot of people who maybe didn't care about politics or government or cared about it and were on one side or the other who are now just totally strongly anti-government online because they've seen the government handle COVID and the lack of personal freedoms and all that. And so Ross, even though it's an entirely different context, his whole idea, again, was to get around government control on, the indivi on what he thought the individual should have control of. And so there are a lot of people now who are looking at this and, and relating the principles because they are related and saying, oh, this guy saw it before we did. And now we just see the worst context of it where it affects everyone because we're locked in our house and we're told our business sure. is shut down. And so he's – I will say this. If he gets commuted, he will be the most sought-after speaker over the next five years. It, he and Snowden, between the two of them, but Snowden has at least spoken publicly already. Ross will be the most sought-after speaker on 
uh, I guess, uh, logic and and theory issues of government and so, just in general that we've ever seen. Do you think he's? You think Donald Trump is going to commute his sentence? If you would have asked me that two months ago, I would have said no fucking way, and I'll tell you uh, why. Uh, sure. Because Trump campaign so hard and trump is hard anti-drugs now he's been he has been very fair to uh non-violent drug offenders he has commuted a lot of sentences during this he was convinced by a lot of people but he ran on the narcotics problem in this country and trying to stem that stem it from the borders and stuff so you'd think he'd be very tough on this but yes the reports right now i think maybe axios no I, someone reported it that he's seriously considering it i think ross aldrich's gonna die in jail Unfortunately, yeah, maybe not. Maybe, but I don't think Donald Trump's going to do it. I don't. I mean, he may, he may very well not. I know that he's. If this reports, anywhere what does he near have to right, gain from it? You want to know my opinion on sure. that? Sure. Like, like what I think now. What clout? Like just no. Pure, just like no. I think. Look, we know Trump has one of the biggest egos of all time. Sure. He was the outsider coming in. He feels like a lot of things were going well for a long time. Then COVID happened, which he feels like was his personal affront to him. I think he is more anti-government than he ever has been before. And there's some of that I empathize with, certainly. And so I think he views this as, all right, maybe I don't at all agree with what this guy did. But this was an Obama judge who put him in jail. for this. It's personal with Trump. An Obama judge in the Southern District of New York, who I fucking hate, who put this guy in jail for two life sentences for creating a fucking website. Fuck you. And hits the button. That's why I think he's considering it. Which Maybe, isn't the yeah, right reason I, to do it. But Well, if the I, I don't think I don't think that guy should be in prison for life. I don't, I think he should he should definitely be in prison for a long time. Yeah. Well well maybe I I shouldn't say definitely, but like I'm I think it's just like it's like I think it's kind of crazy that he's he's gonna be in jail for life. Like mm. what if you if you're really concerned about drugs and you're really like okay hard nosed like punish drugs whatever I think like you know you could easily like send the same message if he's in there for like 15 years or something like that but like hell well, yeah life, life. look it it seems like especially when you consider the fact he most likely wasn't the only dread pirate Roberts which the government just tried to hide the fact that that had been their opinion and they did successfully hide that in court you look at the other sentences. You look at what he did, creating a website, creating the place to do it. it it's it's a five to ten year sentence. That's really that's that's what the legal yeah. opinions seem to be. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of crazy because especially yeah, he's not being prosecuted for killing anyone. So yeah, that's something I forgot because yeah, if he if those if those charges weren't on there, it, he shouldn't be doing life in prison. And if they're not on there, why weren't they on there? If you're if you're the government and you've been working on this guy for three years and you get him and you're like we got the Dread Pirate Roberts, why why don't you put on the biggest case you have against him, which is that he did these hits? There's no there's no logic to that. There's there's no lo it's not maybe like, you, mm. I'm thinking could have been an entrapment defense because like the the government like and I forget entrapment, but basically what I understand mm -hmm. it is if the entrapment is if when the government takes someone who was not otherwise going to commit a crime and like basically and entrapment law gets very confusing in the case law and it's very it's often courts even mess it up when you know it's proper to use but basically like when someone who was otherwise not going to commit a crime the government creates such a like you know basically like makes them commit that crime yep. Yep. you know and it's not it's not simply the government like leading like okay let, let me leave a bike unchained and then someone steals a bike. It's like, it makes it, su like, it's more than that. It's super obvious. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I, st I remember I studied entrapment in law school and it's, it's complicated and it's, it's one of those where it's like, it's, it's, it's tough to. Isn't it very subjective? Super subjective. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a hundred percent subjective, really. And there's different theories on like, well, if the government supplies the necessary element to commit this crime and uh, I don't know, but. There, there's a test for it. I forget it. Well, the other thing But here, I think it would be applicable there because it's like, if the government comes to this guy, and the, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there could be an argument for entrapment there. Well, to add to your case there that you make, because you have to say this, 
at least one of the of the six scenarios, the first one, the Curtis Green guy we talked about, the two government representatives who were on that one, there were two guys. There was a DEA guy named Carl Force, and there was a Secret Service guy who, had, who was called in for the situation. I forget his name. But the DEA guy was the guy who was undercover online with the quote-unquote entrapment in this case. And that guy is currently in jail for six years because he got so out of control with this thing that he started extracting – he he created other accounts posing as like sources that his fake guy that he was playing connected with these fake sources with Ross online to then – blackmail Ross into paying money to them to give him information that was fake, like inside government information about the investigation and stuff. So they later caught that guy and had to put him in jail for six years. And the Secret Service guy, when the Curtis Green thing went down, stole Curtis Green's Bitcoins and didn't tell anyone. So he's in jail for six years too. So part Jeez. of it could also be... The case is a mess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a clusterfuck. It was, it was, it was a clusterfuck, but... Again, like the argument here isn't like Ross's was innocent and he deserved not. No, like he created this thing. Even if his net gain happened, you can't just break every single law in the United States to say nothing of all the other countries. It was an international site and be like, yeah, you know, that's fine. It, it doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. Like he got out of control with it. But then the argument is, well, what was the punishment for the crime? And if he didn't kill people or order people killed and he just created a site for people to do it and just got a little out of control, it's it's not a life sentence. I mean, it's yeah. straight up, it's not. Yeah, I would agree with that. Hey.